Okay, next up, it's um, another Moffat, Moffatier, Matt Robertson Tessie, and he's going to tell us all about the evolutionary tumor board that Bob mentioned in his talk. All right, thanks, Sandy. I want to thank the organizers, Kristen, Sandy. Uh, it seems like we're in a really great time for math oncology as a field, just a lot of interesting talks and even the titles for the next two days are great and just feels like we're you know in this kind of a new phase of getting this into the clinic even so so on that note this is a project that we started a couple of years ago probably just about the time the pandemic hit so kind of sequestered in a room um, to look at forming this evolutionary tumor board which is essentially uh, an attempt at developing feasibility of using math models to guide decision support in a very personalized way. Um, it incorporates a lot of different disciplines in the room. So obviously oncologists, there's evolutionary biologists, math, mathematicians, uh, experimentalists, um, all kinds of uh, knowledge is brought to the table. And generally, generally we're looking for novel treatment hypotheses that will be um, at the moment within standard of care, but uh, not necessarily something that would normally be done. And then the other key point was to see how fast you can do this in real time, because obviously patient decisions are made within, you know, days usually, and modeling and simulation and data analysis can sometimes take longer. So this is our general uh, workflow for the ETB. So we get a patient who consents. So it is a pilot clinical trial. And we collect all the patient data for that patient. And uh, we have general group meetings that will, you know, address the possibilities and then modeling data analysis, um, will be brought to that situation. And then, uh, after discussion, we, we convene the tumor board, which is open to anyone at Moffitt, um, who wants to participate. And we discuss the, pr the pr proposed, uh, therapy strategies that are. Um, arising from the analysis. And then the oncologist ultimately does make the decision. So this is a non-interventional trial, um, but they'll you know, either accept or reject the hypothesis of the treatment um, you know, strategies that have been presented. And in most cases, the, the strategies have been acceptable enough to use them in that, in that particular case. So again, it is a feasibility trial. So as far as like outcomes, if anyone is Wondering, we only have anecdotal evidence that we're doing at least as good as standard of care. And in some cases, we've been a fairly, you know, surprisingly good at predicting certain kind of outcomes over the course of months or even into a year two. And uh, B, the kind of short term predictions of tumor dynamics have been, you know, kind of surprisingly decent considering the simplicity of the model we're using. But really what we're doing here is feasibility. So this is really should be taken as an exemplar. And most interesting is like, how can we use this framework in the future with better models, better data, and that kind of thing. So we've looked at 21 patients so far, um, pretty much dominated by head and neck and sarcomas. Um, those are the two lead oncologists for the trial. But we have started uh, some other areas, so in particular breast cancer and um, this uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, our latest kind of uh, oncologists to join the team. And so hopefully those will also generate lots of patients. The idea is the more of these we do, the more of a library we build up dynamics, um, good models, and then sort of a, also the, the communication with the oncologists is obviously like a key, you know, stumbling block at first. So for the three that, three that we weren't able to generate recommendations, there were various reasons, but the most interesting one is like a case where there was insufficient data and sort of like an expectation of uh, magic from the model, so to speak. So like, you know, it was actually one of the most instructive cases because it caused us to say like, what are the prerequisites to even come to the ETB? You know, you have to bring certain conditions. And so like, sometimes it's like the failures that are actually the most useful when you're doing feasibility. So um, there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of aspects to, and you know, I, it's hard to even do a summary in, in like 10 minutes, but essentially, uh, you know, we have developed a lot of workflows that are sort of streamlined to do this process very quickly. So we sort of to the point where if a patient data is collected, we can generally process like a solution within 24 hours, for example, which is a reasonable time frame for decision support in the clinic. Now that depends obviously on 
you know, a lot of specifics, but, you know, kind of down the road as you build these libraries, that's the, the kind of goal. So I'll just show like an example patient. I'm not, we don't have time to really go into this, but like we collect all the clinical data, all the treatments that were, um, you know, delivered so far before we get to the patient. Um, and so this patient, for example, was three years into like various therapies before they came to the ETB to kind of see what we would do next. And at that point, they were put onto a combination targeted immunotherapy. It was a head and neck cancer patient. And so we've mostly been using a very simple model. So the, the question we started like, you know, the first day was essentially, what's the simplest model that would capture the dynamics of what we see in the clinic? And probably I'd say over 50% of the talks that have shown like, you know, resistance, you end up with what we're calling the U-shaped cancer. You have our mu, as we might call it, the Greek letter mu. So you have your growth, right? Or for you guys growth. And then you have some sort of response to the treatment. And then you have recurrence. So you get this kind of Greek letter mu shape. You can kind of see that over there in the, the first part of that curve. It goes up, down, and then starts to turn around. So, you know, kind of the simplest model you can do is you need a growth term, you need a death term, and you need some sort of resistance. So this is the model that we decided to use. It has other names like tumor growth inhibition model, and so you may have seen it in other places. So it's very simple. It's all exponential dynamics. Every plot you'll see will be on the log plot. So that's why everything looks linear, um, but it's exponential growth, et cetera. And so that's kind of the patient's history. You can see the treatments on the bottom. You can see some arbitrary like fits using this model to one of the lesions in dark blue. This person then had a radiotherapy, which, you know, observationally seemed to cure all the visible lesions. But then like, you know, six months later had a bunch of lung mets and lymph node mets. Those are kind of the lighter colors there on the right that started to grow. Um, there's a huge component of radiology that we brought into this, which is that diameters are not enough to really look at this. So we've had radiologists go back through three years of patient scans and look at three-dimensional volumetric measurements of every possible lesion, or at least up to like, you know, the first 10 or something, which is a lot more than is done currently, which is, you know, you pick one, two, maybe three target lesions and you measure like a recist criteria and then you know, 20% up or down or what have you. So that's been a big, uh, you know, big effort is to get radiologists uh, input on like, you know, what do these volumes mean? Even like the limits of detection, we've kind of explored how to retrospectively find small tumors that, you know, at the time of the scan, you wouldn't necessarily have found, but like, you know, post, post uh, you know, that scan, you would then be able to say, oh, it was here. No, yeah, I do see like us millimeter lesion. The other um, key point is to look at retrospective data, obviously, because with N of one and a model, you can make it do whatever you want. But there are obviously biological constraints on some parameters. So like, you know, the exponential growth rate of a tumor can't like double every two hours. It makes no sense. So, you know, you can constrain it to that extent, but that still leaves you a huge range of outcomes. So we've looked at a lot of retrospective patients. So we've collected, you know, dozens of head and neck patients, for example, that received this particular combination of therapies and see what happened to them. So we analyze all their pre-treatment and on-treatment dynamics. We fit this model to that patient in a cohort-based fashion. Um, we see what kind of parameter ranges can occur. You know, some, combination, some combinations might do very well. Some might never really reduce the burden more than an order of magnitude. And so you wouldn't put a very high efficacy parameter prediction for your, your current patient if you don't see that in the clinic. And then we also use clinical trial data, which is obviously much more, you know, cohort, zoomed out, you know, non-line level data to also calibrate the model. So if you see progression free survival lasting from like six to 20 months, your model should be able to recapitulate that, right? It shouldn't progress within, you know, six years or something it wouldn't make sense. So all those kind of constraints start to narrow down these cohorts and eventually you want to create some sort of, you know, uncertainty will arise and so you'll get sort of prediction cones. And so again, this is just an exemplar. It's not really the way we do it, like uh, in terms of the, a cone is like fuzzy, right? So the borders don't really mean a lot here, but like, you know, in that cone over there, you can see it's a huge range at first because you really don't have a lot of information for this patient in terms of their response. But you can say that like based on like everything that's been seen retrospectively, we have, you know, the potential for many orders of magnitude of tumor volume decline. And we also have the potential of immediate progression. 
But interestingly, since this patient had already seen these agents in like kind of short bursts, we were able to actually make a more specific patient fit, which is kind of the lighter blue shaded area. And so we suggested they might reduce their tumor by an order of magnitude at the three month mark when they got their next scan. That was the prediction of the model. And then you show the whole cone just to see. So Bob talked about extinction therapy and the multi-strike therapy. So for this particular patient, the goal was to see if we can put together a series of strikes to reduce their tumor burden. Now, to be fair, a lot of the patients we get in ETB are sort of, you know, kind of the most aggressive cases, the ones that are looking for some sort of novel approach because a lot of other things have failed. So it's hard to imagine for some of these patients that any of the available strikes are going to drive this even below like, you know, imaging detection levels. So in some sense, this is not, it's the intent would be to cure, but like it's, it's probably impossible for these patients, but the practice is the feasibility. So the idea is to apply the second strike here as soon as we reach sort of a, or approach the nadir of the first strike, right? And so we can predict that. And again, all this kind of historical data comes into play, but the insets, insets show the overlay of two different chemotherapy second strikes. And if they're applied after the time of the first follow-up scan, what would happen? So first of all, the first follow-up scan ended up showing an order of magnitude reduction, which end of one. So we got lucky, of course, but, you know, kind of matched the mathematical prediction. So we update the models to say, okay, well, the efficacy of this combo is significant, right? It's on the better side of what we saw in clinical trials. So we can update the model and rerun the whole analysis and then say, what if we switch tomorrow to the chemotherapy option? Then the model basically says don't because the cones are overlapping. So there's really no advantage to doing switching the first strike. We expect to get more efficacy based on all the statistics of the possible outcomes. We expect to get additional efficacy out of the combo therapy during the next three month period. So we should wait for one more scan and not switch yet. All right, so you wait for one more scan that's shown in the inset in red. And again, now we rerun the predictions for the chemotherapy starting from this kind of new analysis. And now we start seeing that it's probably getting close to time to switch to your next strike. And then that forms the recommendation at that point, which is, you know, they're going to probably start to turn the corner before the next imaging scan. So think about switching to your choice of chemo um, at that point. So we see this as like a, a very long-term project. Our ultimate goal is that this sort of approach would someday be like a standard of care, but that's very far away because we're just like figuring out how to even do it feasibility, let alone improve outcomes, you know, objectively. So we're definitely in this orange phase. Um, our next step after we sort of go through this feasibility trial, which will be about 35 patients, is to start to try and put this into some clinical trials for very specific diseases with purpose-built models that are much more, you know, calibrated. So the modeling aspect has probably been worked on the least. Um, it's kind of like a swap swappable model that someone can come in and indeed like Jill has brought some prostate adapted models into this framework to kind of, you know, look at that. So uh, we do have, um, oh, press the wrong button. we just are starting this summer, a new uh, trial, which is um, going to be for uh, pediatric and young adult cancers. And it's uh, going to be at eight different participating institutions around the U S and uh, so that's going to be basically a, an upped, up, up the ante on this approach and start to really build modules that hopefully in a few years will then be able to run an actual like interventional, you know, trial using this approach through that. So um, this is a part of a much larger kind of approach that we have at Moffitt, which is our center of excellence for evolutionary therapy. And that's led by Sandy and Bob and also Damon Reed, who's one of our sarcoma docs. And um, yeah, I just also kind of want to highlight if people want to speak at our monthly seminar series, please get in touch with me because we are going to start bringing people in now that now that travel is opened up again. But you know, we're we're always trying to like promote evolutionary therapy just broadly. So we're as part of our system there. So with that, I will conclude. Twenty seconds left. Nice. Um, a lot of people involved. A lot of different disciplines. So the colors kind of show some of the disciplines and the people who are here. And this list is even larger now depending on which exemplar patient we show. But um, yeah, so thank you very much. Any questions?
Okay, that's that's amazing. This is just phenomenal to see. Um, one of the things I was really curious about is the the timing of everything. So we all know, like getting your model ready, getting the data curated to go into the parameterization. What kind of timeline are you looking at? Like you get the last scan, yeah. and then when do you next talk to the clinicians? So yeah, that's the thing we've been really trying to like develop over this process. When we first started this process, it would take like weeks or maybe up to a month to really the first time you saw a new cancer because you had to gather all literature find these patients the radiology was like one of the big like bottlenecks just to go through hundreds of scans like in such detail but now basically you know if we have a patient that we've seen this cancer a lot of that retrospective data has already been collected the models have been calibrated and they're ready to go and then you're just plugging in the patient data so basically as fast as the radiologist can you know read the the the, the lesion sizes or whatever biomarker you're using that gets fed. And then, like I said, the modeling process, now we have it down to like, you know, within a day, we can provide an answer of like what the predictions would be if we have that complete framework, like calibrated to That's that awesome. disease already. Yeah. Nice. Uh, kind of follow up. So interacting with the clinicians mm -hmm. on this uh, trial, um, how much, how engaged are they? Like, do they like talking about the modeling? Do they? Yeah. Do they so I think, you know, it's been definitely a process of like, first, like understanding what we actually can and can't do. And there's a lot of limitations, obviously, to this. So like people think, oh, you're going to tell me what to do, but it's really like statistical outcomes. And then in a lot of cases, what's been interesting is that we've been able to use the clinical intuition as sort of a, an input to the, the framework. So there are cases where you might say the model can't tell you which one is better unless you want to make a guess, get an educated guess about how well, say, their immunotherapy might still be working. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you think the immunotherapy is doing the bulk of like what's happening, then you should do A. And if you think the immunotherapy has run its course, then you should do B. And so then the clinician will be like, well, I think, you know, having seen other patients in this situation, you know, my gut is that the immunotherapy is done. Well, then they can put that in, you, know, you can put that in the framework and say, well, then B is really the best way to go. So like we've even been able to incorporate sort of like the, the wisdom of the clinician into the framework in certain cases. So it's been a good dialogue, I think, overall. That's so. awesome. That's really great to hear. Thank no, you. Thank you.